Welcome to IGM Guru. IGM Guru is one of the global leading online training and certification provider for IT expert by the skilled IT gurus to help them achieve their professional goals. Let me know if uh, everything is fine. You guys are able to see the screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, to begin with, uh, we all know uh, what is cloud. Uh, if, if you could just mute yourself and uh, talk whenever it's needed, it'll help me. There's a slight background noise. Thank you. Uh, chat. Number of it. Okay. So cloud. Uh, let's understand what is cloud. Uh, what is the basics of cloud? How does a cloud look like and what it happens? Okay. Um, cloud is not a technology to start with. It is a, a service uh, which is there. Okay. Why do you call it as a service? Uh, cloud is nothing but uh, it's a business approach to a data center. Okay. That's basically cloud. So what, what exactly happened? Uh, in layman terms, if I have to say, uh, Instead of me buying a car, I have started renting out the car. Uh, that's, that's exactly which has happened on the cloud. Instead of buying a data center, I have renting. I have started renting out the data center, which is called a cloud. But then, um, on top of that, what is happening is we have a lot of services which gets enabled because now, since I am renting it out, uh, the service provider is able to well manage the cloud. Uh, he is able to add a lot of services for me and give it as a service to me on the same cloud. So cloud is basically a utility computing. Uh, when I say utility computing, it is uh, more of uh, uh, pay as you go. That is, on a monthly basis, you subscribe and uh, use and pay and go on. Okay. Second important thing which you need to remember is SOA, service oriented architecture. Uh, service oriented architecture is nothing but uh, uh, a methodology where uh, a cloud provider is uh, going to uh, follow to call himself as a cloud. Okay? Uh, without that methodology, uh, you just cannot do anything. Okay? Uh, every service provider, whoever says uh, himself as a cloud, they have to follow the methodology of the cloud and there is no other choice. Right? So that's a service-oriented architecture. So it defines service-oriented architecture defines uh, how a cloud approach has to be. It doesn't define what has to be, I mean, how it has to be built. I mean, uh, it gives the guidelines and it does not give the precise steps to the service provider. You can, the service provider can do the same thing or achieve the same thing in uh, different ways. Okay. Uh, so the third important thing is SLA, service level agreement. Okay. Uh, that you understand that uh, we need to have a minimum uh, a bare minimum service level agreement between the customer and the service provider so that tomorrow if anything goes wrong uh, somebody would take the ownership to solve that problem. That's, that's the whole idea of uh, SLA either on the customer side or on the service provider side. The most important uh, top uh, five priorities of uh, uh, properties of a cloud is uh, scalability, availability, manageability accessibility and performance. Uh, scalability is basically a reliability. Scalability is nothing but I would be able to do a vertical scaling or a horizontal scaling. Okay. When I say a vertical scaling, uh, I could create a resource. I can blow it up. I mean, I could increase the size of the resource. A horizontal scaling is nothing but I could create multiple resources of the same thing uh, uh, in a short duration of time. Say for example, uh, 
continuously I'm using only 10 machines, suddenly I can go up to 200 machines and come down again to 10 machines. That's the scalability stuff, which every service provider has to provide me uh, to call them as a cloud service provider. Availability is nothing but it should be available and uh, I would need to have something called 99.99% uh, .99 or 99.0%. So the availability today uh, in cloud varies from 99% to 99.99%. Uh, so the range is 8 hours uh, downtime to 15 minutes of downtime per year. That is what the range is. And uh, if, if the service provider has assigned an agreement with you for 99.99%, uh, he, he agrees that uh, the downtime of your machines will not be downtime. I'm talking about the downtime, not the data, uh, uh, data, uh, data getting destroyed or anything. It is just the downtime of your service, which I'm talking about. And that will not be above 15 minutes per year is what he's going to promise. Yeah, you need to pay for that amount. Uh, for 99%, if you're paying, uh, say, uh, one, 10 rupees, uh, maybe for 99.99%, you pay like 60 rupees or 50 rupees. So that cost is always there. Manageability, uh, the, when I talk about manageability, it is more of, uh, okay, let, let me just show you that screen of manageability. Um, yeah, manageability is more of uh, interoperability and uh, automation, uh, monitoring, uh, okay. Um, control automation I can I can do anything on the cloud and automate the whole process that's the whole idea and uh, I can create a self-healing system I can say if this happens go do this if that happens go do this I can I can create all kind of self rules to self heal itself okay uh, that's the whole idea about automation it, uh, and the most important thing is monitoring a service provider He's a cloud service provider if and only he has a full-fledged monitoring system in his cloud, whether it is for physical or virtual hardware, doesn't matter. Network access patterns, just logs. It should be able to monitor anything, including your billing system. It should be able to alert me on your billing system, not only monitor it. So that's most important for a manageability. Okay. And um, uh, talking about the availability, uh, I missed out one. Thing, the availability is your fault tolerance uh, apart from having an uptime of the devices it will have uh, it will have it will not have a single point of failure okay your data would be distributed or copied into one more uh, zone or a data center or a region whatever you call it as in some other location based on your uh, configuration so that your data is still secured and you can you can take it out even if there is a major uh, disaster which has happened in this uh, premises. Performance, if you talk about, uh, uh, there are a lot of parallel computing, lo uh, load balancing which is happening in job scheduling. Uh, that's your performance. I can do load balancing between my resources. I can do job scheduling. What is job scheduling? I can, I can say I need to switch on this machine at this point of time. I need to switch off this point of time. So I'm saving cost because why is it very important of job scheduling? A simple job scheduling of uh, switching on and switching off is very important because uh, say for in 24 hours, you're using only for eight hours. And now we, we don't buy these servers. We are renting out these servers, okay? Servers, I mean to say a machine. When I rent out something, I pay per hour on cloud. So, if, if I, uh, so end of the uh, month, I have a bill which gets generated. If I have to reduce the bill, I need to be very careful on the usage on a, on a daily basis. So if I can schedule a job saying I need at 9 o'clock, switch it off at 6 o'clock, I save on the compute power, compute uh, price, compute cost. 
so that way indirect directly I'm saving like two third of my money okay so that's most important that is how you can do job scheduling load balancing I can distribute the loads uh, across data centers across regions to have a complete I ask something sorry can I ask I wanted to ask something yeah sure uh, when you talk about uh, Load, uh, that part of load balancing and being able to 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 turn off uh, when you're not using a resource. For instance, if you have a server with all your resources on it, okay, and then uh, for instance, uh, it, it, uh, your site is only used during day. In the night, there is nothing going on. Okay, can you turn this site off at night and then only let it work during day? Yes, you can. Uh, to be more precise, what you can do is uh, we can configure uh, uh, auto scaling, which is also another uh, good feature where uh, uh, you can say um, uh, in the day I, I would need seven machines uh, and in the night uh, there is nothing, so only one machine will keep running. You can do that. Okay. okay. And you don't get billed for the ones that are not running? Yes. The, you don't get build for your compute that is so the billing happens separately for storage the billing happens separately mm. for uh, CPU and memory okay. mm. so you will be charged okay. for the storage but not for the CPU and memory yeah uh, and therefore so I ask something relating to the costs and so forth do you have an experience on uh, how much uh, usually an average hosting costs for a simple uh, application in a zoo. Web server? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you get yourself a server and then you put your application there, uh, one that is not busy, maybe if you have like maybe 50 visitors in a day, something like that. Uh, I, I think it is around, uh, I know the INR price is 15 rupees, approximately 10 to 15 rupees per hour. Uh, per hour? Per hour is around 10 to 15 rupees. So it, it would be around uh, uh, $1 for 6 hours. 6 hours? Yeah, 5 okay. to 6 hours, $1. Of approximately $4, I mean 4 hours, $1. 1 USD. Mm. That is the pricing for okay. on an hourly basis, I mean. Just for you to understand. So that's a... It is... Uh, yeah. Just one moment. You said it is about one dollar for four hours. That's correct. Okay. That's Pro fine. Approximately, yeah. Okay, and that includes your full-fledged uh, machine, which is running uh, uh, for, uh, and as you said, you need fifty users who are uh, coming and accessing it. Okay. Approximately, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a pretty decent stuff. Uh, if you're running it for 12 hours also, it's like $3 or $4 a day on an average. So uh, in a month, you're getting like $100 to $120. That's, that's an average usage. Yeah, I think it's actually much fair because if you go for a dedicated server, you pay about uh, 400, 300 US dollars a month. You stuff you, like that. You pay 400 dollars a month. Yeah, if you go for some dedicated server hostings with other providers. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there are some kind of uh, container-based services, and if your usage is mm -hmm. very low. Uh, maybe around average usage is around 20 to maximum is 40 hits uh, at any point of time in the day. Uh, you go for a container service which is much, much smaller and you pay lesser than whatever, whatever uh, we just discussed. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's again, uh, the reason is it's in a shared environment, but then... Uh, mm. We are okay with that because we, we don't have any critical data which is going to get uh, leaked off and anything. It's anyways just a static website, a simple static website which everybody has to access. Mm. That's it. Maybe a blog or anything. It could be anything. Right? 
Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's that's about the performance. Like uh, you have a lot of parallel computing. You have uh, bit level parallelization, uh, data level parallelization, task level parallelization. So that's that's how your parallel uh, computing works. Load balancing. Uh, improve the utilize, resource utilization, system performance, and uh, avoid uh, one point of failure. Job uh, job uh, scheduling. The next most important thing is uh, accessibility. When I talk about accessibility, it is more of anyone, anytime, anywhere, and that's one of the key uh, for the cloud. Uh, and that is one of the very important. Uh, thing which has been mentioned in the SOA as a methodology that if you call yourself as a cloud provider you need to make sure everybody your your customers are able to access the cloud from a common web page uh, from a browser okay not a common web page from a browser basically any kind of browser it should work because we are today we are everybody are comfortable with web browsers and uh, that's one of the ask or a very important uh, requirement of a SOA, uh, service oriented architecture. Okay. Uh, also, uh, uh, the other thing is in, in cloud it's all multi-tenant, which makes it very, very uh, uh, feasible for the cloud providers as well because you might use it for three months and after that somebody can uh, come and use the same hardware for the next three months. Or so. And not only that, at the same time, multiple users can be part of the same hardware. So that feature is also important because uh, putting multiple customer on the same hardware is not a big deal. Securing them from each other is the most important and critical part of it. Right? So uh, that is also taken care. So that's most important uh, benefit. And what's, what's a, what are the benefits of the cloud? Uh, reduce initial investment, capital expenditure is reduced. Improves industrial specialization because I don't need to be worried about uh, hiring a, a, a knowledgeable person for my IT. I don't need uh, a level three support engineers uh, whom I don't even know how to recruit. Uh, so all those headaches are gone from me. Okay, uh, improve resource utilization. I might, I as a customer, I might just have a team to do the monitoring of my services which are there on the cloud and uh, intimate me if there is any disruption in the service, and then I can go back uh, to Azure saying uh, there's something down. Uh, uh, please help me rectify. I can, I can just have an application level support guys uh, within my organization. Uh, and I don't need to worry about the hardware or uh, the software which is installed on the system because that would be taken care by the service provider. Okay, so that's the best part of uh, all the things because most of the non-IT organization who who try to develop, who are a developers or it could be anybody. Just don't think as a developer. It it could be, uh, uh, for example, Volvo, who's uh, manufacturing something. Uh, and they want some IT support uh, instead of having it on their own premises they'll just go the cloud way uh, they'll say okay uh, I don't need to set up anything let me put everything on the cloud I will have a private link to the cloud and get things going uh, so very much possible Ola who's actually a, a car company or a service company they don't need to set up a data center to access the Ola app. They can set up the whole thing on the cloud, and that is how they have set it up. Uh, I think uh, they are on AWS. I'm not too sure, but yeah, I think so. They are on one of the cloud. So they really don't. I mean, these are not an IT or a non-IT. It's all a non-IT company. Uh, uh, they don't even do any kind of development. They are doing service, uh, which is completely out of IT. And it now serves the purpose for everybody. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Uh, that's about the cloud definitions, which I really wanted to give. Uh, any doubts before I move to the next topic?
I think it's fine. Okay, right. So quickly, let, let me just go through the virtualization. I hope you guys understand virtualization. Just uh, me yes or no, so that uh, uh, how how comfortable are you both with virtualization? Have you worked on it? Have you seen it before? Do you understand what is virtualization? Have I've seen it before? Okay, but I've never implemented one. No problem. Uh, Praveen, how about you? Yeah, yeah, with you. I can I, I can feel the virtualization is nothing but that uh, maintaining different. Uh, Yeah, so uh, virtualization, let me just rush you through in a two or three minutes uh, on the slide, okay. Uh, so virtualization is nothing but on a single physical hardware. Uh, I can run multiple operating systems instead of just running Windows or a Linux individually. What I do is I put a virtualization platform called Hypervisor. It could be either the standard which is open in the market, which is available in the market for us to use is Zen from Citrix, KVM from Red Hat and VMware ESXi and also you have Microsoft's Hyper-V. On top of that I can just go uh, install operating systems okay uh, just for your benefit uh, probably I can uh, just show you um, just give me a second uh, ESXi so so this is how uh, a VMware console looks like uh, once you install the ESXi which is a hypervisor you install it and uh, you get this uh, screen uh, on your laptop uh, where you connect to this host this is called the host and you create machines uh, something like, or oh, this is called the host, this is called uh, the data center, but I mean, uh, that is how it has been explained. And you see this Oracle Solaris uh, is called a virtual machine. So uh, this is your host on which you install this ESXi and you can control it from your laptop. And this is how something looks like. And you create a virtual machine and you can create n number of virtual machines. So this is how it typically looks like. Uh, and uh, you can control it, you can create, increase the uh, machine size, decrease the machine size. Uh, on, on the local hypervisor platform, you do it uh, manually by shutting down the systems, but on the cloud, cloud is also built based on this virtualization technology. That's why I'm saying, I'm explaining you this because the whole of cloud is built on virtualization architecture. Without virtualization, the cloud story could not be true today. Uh, so, uh, cloud exists. I have a question on this. Yes. Uh, if, for, for example, you have a, res uh, a resource on the cloud, for instance, a virtual machine. Yeah. You, mean you can install a virtualization software like the ESXi on it and then have sub-machines on one particular server that you're renting? Um, <laughs> I have actually tried that on AWS. It works, mm. uh, but that's not a best practice. It works. Okay. You can do that, uh, but it it is not a great practice as such. Why? Uh, because the uh, what uh, the cloud provider says is they are not going to support you uh, if there is any uh, virtualization issue on the virtual machines inside your ESXi because you're doing a double virtualization because they have already virtualized it. So what you need to mm. do is um, you need to ask them or tell them that I need a bare metal server. Okay. They provide you a bare mm. metal where they will not install a hypervisor. You could install your own hypervisors and then use it. Yeah. You can okay. do that. Mm. Okay. Because uh, a hypervisor over an hypervisor is always a double overhead on the hardware uh, wherein it, it doesn't work uh, for a production setup it, it is definitely not recommended as a test bed you can do anything you can create it you can work on it you can test anything mm -hmm. that is fine okay. as a production system definitely no 
Okay, then another question is, why do they call this guest, S, uh, guest OS? I've seen this in uh, Azure several times, rather in, uh, in, in ESXi. ESXi. <laughs> whenever you're, yeah, whenever you're, you're implementing a new virtual machine, that you have to choose a guest, a guest OS. But so, why, why is it a guest OS? So it's a terminology which is used in the virtualization world. Because when you say ah. guest OS, it is called virtual machine. Or if you just in, say uh, OS, means it is getting installed directly on the physical box. OK. OK, that's the difference. If I say it is a guest OS, means you are installing a virtual machine. That is what is my understanding. Okay. Okay. So the uh, uh, the other name of the virtual machine, the OS, whatever. If I say there is an OS, I will ask whether it's a guest OS or a normal OS because I would like to know indirectly. I'm asking you whether it's a virtual machine or is it on a physical machine. Okay. That's that's a terminology which has been used. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So that's. Uh, that's about uh, the virtualization. Today, uh, this virtualization has been there for the last 15 to 18 years now. And today, uh, we have gone beyond this uh, called containers. We'll talk about containers after two to three weeks of our Azure classes. Uh, for now, think of containers like uh, virtualization is nothing like breaking your physical box into multiple machines. Containers are nothing but breaking, uh, uh, having application level virtualization. That is, on a single guest OS, I can have multiple applications isolated. Okay, that's called containers. Okay, now, now that I have multiple guest OS which are isolated on a physical hardware, similarly, if I can have multiple applications isolated from each other in a single guest OS, I call that as containers, and which is very hot on the market today. Okay, we will talk about that uh, later. Okay, that's another thing which is actually uh, booming up so very well because there's a lot of benefits behind that. Okay, so that's about the hypervisor benefits of hypervisor. You understand encapsulation, isolation, and all those things. Uh, so the, the next topic which I want to touch base is uh, service models, okay? Um, I'll, I'll be sharing this slide so you can uh, peacefully go through the, uh, the, the sentences and all those things. Uh, service models are priority uh, the top three uh, service models. I mean, uh, I would not say these are the only service models. These are the top three service models, IAS, PaaS, and SaaS. Okay. Infrastructure as a service is nothing but where the service provider is going to take the ownership, ownership of virtualization platform, network, compute, and storage. Okay. Platform as a service is nothing but where the service provider takes up. So in IAS, what happens is you go create a virtual machine on top of that, and you have the control over the OS. You have control over the uh, software which you have installed. It's under your control. Everything is yours, but the hardware is not yours. At any point of time, hardware is not yours. You don't need to worry about the virtualization technology there. Monitoring is done on the hardware. Everything is fine. Platform as a service is nothing but where I create a platform for this is mostly for the developers. Okay, I install an operating system. I install some of the softwares. I install a development tool. Create a runtime environment. I create some resource management, fault tolerance. Okay, I'll do load balancing for that as a service provider. I'll do everything for my customer so that the the customer comes and just develops its, his application and uses it. He should not be bothered about. Uh, how to get this installed, how to configure these things, blah, 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 blah. And that is the market today which is getting uh, scaled up because uh, uh, IAS has been there for the last 15 years, in fact. And today, everybody are concentrating on platform as a service because that's the key. 
to the actual problem in the industry. And uh, software as a service is, uh, so uh, infrastructure as a service is, this is the diagram, actual diagram, uh, where you go create virtual machines. Uh, you actually virtualize everything, okay? Uh, virtual machines, virtual storage, virtual network, everything is virtualized, okay? Uh, you have platform as a service where you have a platform like a Google uh, App Engine, Hadoop. These are all platforms where you can do something on top of that, right? Software as a service, software as a service is nothing but an end product. If you see the examples, it is an end product which is there. Google Apps, Salesforce.com. Uh, anything which serves one single purpose in fact. I call that as software as a service. So you create an application on top of Azure uh, and you give it to the customer. For the customer, that's a software as a service. Okay. Uh, say for example, you build an application, ERP application, uh, you build it on Azure, but the, your customer is not bothered where it is. So for him it is a software as a service. For you it is a platform as a service because you might be uh, developing on top of that. So I hope you understand every stage how it has been distributed. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Cool. So that's about the software as a service. Uh, it's a general application, business application, scientific applications or government based applications. The last topic for the day, in fact, I, I just want to keep it uh, within these slides for the day, uh, introduction to the cloud, uh, and uh, really a last topic, or and it's open to the discussion, is deployment models, very important, okay? How things are deployed and what you call it as and all those things, okay? Just for this, I, I really want to uh, get a slide up, give me a second. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, you understand, uh, I mean this slide is actually a, a single slide um, which will give you just a brief of whatever we just went through, uh, okay, it's an overview which you get. But if you see here, uh, this is the data center, okay, this box uh, is your data center. You have network storage and servers, that's how a data center looks like. And I call this as a cloud only if I have an orchestration layer, a building system, and the customer is able to access this orchestration layer. What is orchestration layer? The customer does not know what kind of hardware is there, what kind of network components are there. And it is just a web portal the customer accesses and says, I need 50 machines. It goes for the approval with his manager, and if his manager approves it uh, for the costing, it's going, it's, it's going to be created. I mean, just, I'm just giving you a hypothetical slow work of how this happens. Why am I saying this now? Because now let's go back to the slide which I wanted to talk about, deployment models. There are four deployment models, public, private, community, and hybrid. For a public cloud, the only thing is the whole, the billing orchestration layer and the data center is managed by the service provider. Okay, and the service provider is going to have multiple customers on his infrastructure. Okay, that's called a public cloud. Okay, for a private cloud, there are two parts in it. One part is me being a customer, I will still go to the service provider and say, you know what, I, I don't want the hardware to be shared. I need a dedicated hardware. I need dedicated things for me. I'm ready to pay for it. Maybe I need some 20 physical machines dedicated for me. You have to close the networking such a way that no physical networking comes into my uh, systems and it's purely for me, uh, for my testing purpose. Okay, so that piece of hardware is until I release it from my use. I call that as a private cloud and I will have a private connection from my, uh, if, I have, if at all I have a data center on my premise, I'll have a private connection. Yes, Andrew. 
Does, does Microsoft offer that yes. as, a, as a service that they can do a private cloud for you? Yeah, they, they do a private cloud service. But it has, it's not like the normal um, VMs that you you provision via Azure portal? Yeah, it would be it would be uh, VMs from the Azure portal itself. So, uh, what but then, do, how do you differentiate that? Uh, so, what happens is, if you're going for a, a, a paid account, a prepaid uh, account, uh, only mm -hmm. then you will get a dedicated hardware. Uh, you get into a call. Uh, you you call up Azure and say, "Boss, I'm ready to pay half a million a year, and I need uh, uh, these many hardwares." And he's gonna go say that I have these many hardwares, I will dedicate it for you and he will he'll create an account for you, he'll attach all those hardwares to your account. So whenever you create a machine, it's just gonna be there. He can do that in the backend. Okay. That's, that's how a private cloud is built. Not only he, I mean any cloud provider today is able to do that. Your Azure, Google or AWS, DigitalOcean's which has come up newly, everybody is able to do that. Okay. Okay, and that's the that's the beauty of it. Say, for example, uh, uh, publicly available uh, data centers of Azure are only uh, 60, but there are privately uh, privately built data centers. Out of the 60, not all are in public use. Okay, uh, almost 10 are not for public use. Okay, which is only for private use. Okay, those. Uh, okay. When I say that, means whenever you you being on a uh, you create a public cloud account, I mean a normal cloud account, where you don't have any specification, you go create a machine, it will be part of the 50 data centers. But if I, if you call up and say, you know, I have a big project, I am giving you an upfront money, partial money, or whatever it is, then he, he will go and provision for you a private cloud, he can dedicate hardware for you, he has a system internally built, and that's the whole idea. Okay. Okay, and that's the. But how do you verify that uh, he's not, he's not, he's unable, he's really providing what you agreed? So uh, there is a way where he actually shows you the physical hardware details, and he monitors that for mm. you and sh runs a report on that for you. Okay. Yeah. So I understand what you're trying to sure. say. Yeah, that's that's definitely a challenge, but yes. Uh, uh, Azure also provides. Apart from this, this is one side of the private cloud, but apart from this, uh, the other side of the private cloud is you have a, a premises, you have a data center. Now a data center cannot be called as a cloud until unless you put an orchestration layer on top of that and do a billing system, even though it is for internal use. Only then I call it as a cloud. Even for that, today Azure has a solution called Azure Stack which is exactly a Xerox copy of the portal of the Azure portal. But now that complete portal is available inside your data center for your hardware which is there. Not exactly your hardware, uh, you need to buy the Azure stack along with the predefined hardware. So it comes as a stack. Today you don't have an option saying that you can install Azure stack on any of the hardware which are available in the data center. Uh, you need to buy it as a private cloud solution from Microsoft. But yes, that is also available, which is an offline data center, private cloud data center, which is inside your premises. Make sense? That is also available from uh, open source market like OpenStack, CloudStack, uh, Eucalyptus, and all those things, all those guys, VMware, these guys also do the same thing. Okay, build your own private cloud inside your own premises. Uh, for example, Banks cannot go on cloud, right? They uh, they have a strict rule from uh, the central government saying that you cannot go uh, on a cloud and all those things. So typically for them, uh, there's a good cloud solution. Why why do you still need a cloud solution on the internal? To avoid all those manual work, you send a mail to your IT engineer to create a virtual machine and all those things. To avoid all those things, I put a workflow there saying, I need machines. Your manager approves it, it goes for uh, IT approval, and if the hardware is there, it just goes provision it. So that's the whole idea of the cloud. So you mean, so you mean banks only have like uh, their own data centers privately? Yeah. They don't go to... 
very, very true, very true. Okay. Uh, at least I know in India, none of the banks are allowed to go on cloud. None. Uh, there is something called RBI, Reserve Bank of India. Mm. Uh, they will immediately cancel the license if, if they get to know that the data, the, the core banking data is outside their premises. Oh, so their servers have to be on their premises? Yes, they have. To, it has to be in one of their premises. Okay. In but fact, case, they can go for private cloud. Yes, they would go for a private cloud. In fact, they went to an extent to say to the SBI saying that uh, SBI's per state data has to be inside that state only. SBI is the biggest bank, the largest bank in India, uh, State Bank of India. It has gone to an extent saying that they cannot uh, consolidate their banking across the states. It has to be within that state for some reason because of the data is huge, because of theft of the data, it could be anything but they're not allowing that. So even though the authentication mm -hmm. happens, but the core banking, say for example, I'm a customer of SBI and my account is in uh, Karnataka, means my account stays in Karnataka. My account will be there only here. And if I'm moving to uh, another state, I have to intimate them saying that, please move my account there. Get the point. <laughs> so meaning you cannot make transactions outside the US state? No, no, you, I can do all my transactions, but if I do within my state, it will be faster. If I do it from outside state, it will be, it will take some time. Okay. Uh, today, online transactions are there. I can do any kind of transaction, but the data, it's, my data is always stored within that state where I created the account. That's the rule. Okay. Okay. In fact, uh, okay. the private banks are getting also that heat. Uh, because the problem is if, if you just consolidate everything it becomes easy for an attacker to attack him. and uh, but this is not the case in US uh, US I've, I've, I've heard that uh, there are certain banks which are on AWS but they are on a private cloud of AWS which is not available on public uh, fair enough uh, if they are able to uh, go through all the security concerns which a bank has mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's about uh, your private and public. Uh, the next thing is your um, uh, community cloud. Community cloud is pretty straightforward. Uh, say, for example, there are uh, 10 institutes, large institutes, and everybody wants to build their own data center and a cloud, but they don't have the finance to do that. So all the 10 come together and say, okay, let's set up uh, a data center. Let's put a cloud on top of that and uh, uh, let's share that infrastructure and uh, I know the fact that only those 10 uh, institutes are going to be part of the cloud so it's a, it's a closed uh, community so uh, it's a kind of a semi-private cloud it's a closed community I know who is there and there is a set of rules and uh, I know the data is safe so that's called a community cloud basically yeah okay and uh, the last one is your hybrid cloud where it is a combination of everything where as a customer I have one set of hardwares or one set of resources running on my private cloud, one set of resources in my public cloud, something is running on an on-premise and all the three are connected uh, somehow. So this is a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a basic understanding of uh, or introduction to the cloud. Uh, which I expect uh, you uh, to understand so that uh, uh, the terminologies are pretty clear when we start off with Azure topic. Yeah, I think this was very helpful. <laughs> Last time you had also said that we're going to go through subnetting and a bit of networking stuff. Yes. Is it still on the list? Yes, tomorrow and day after we are going to do that for the next two days okay. and uh, tentatively on Thursday we'll start off with the short topics. Okay. Is that okay? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if, yeah. if it might be boring but I expect uh, let's go through that once uh, uh, so okay. that we, we are on the same page. It's uh, fine. I don't, think it, I don't think it's boring. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. I have a bit boring. Yeah. So, as Azure is a product of Microsoft, is there any limitations on uh, 
sorry uh, on any other uh, is there any limitations on the technology which can install on azure uh as of today i have not seen anything because you can uh, even though azure is a uh, azure is part of microsoft but they are looking at azure yeah. as a complete cloud sto story and a competitor for aws and google so when you look at as a bigger competitor you need to come out of your comfort zone and today they support all kind of linux flavors anything on the linux also mm -hmm. so even though the linux is a competitor for themselves they are running azure as a separate entity actually and uh, so uh, yeah I, i don't see a challenge they have all kind of workloads but yeah uh, they prefer more of microsoft windows workloads but they can handle anything and everything okay okay so will, will they get any uh, will they provide anything uh, if they are going for microsoft products because as uh, if they go, if you are going for a windows and sql or something like that they will get a, they will get a, in a something in a package something like less or else it, it, it the price would be different the prices are going to be different because uh, for a one time price and a ongoing price the, the prices are going to be different so in case if you are uh, if you want to use something for a lesser period of time your roi is going to be better if you go for a, a monthly rental charges it's like it's a simple concept of your car rental if you want to uh, if you're planning to keep the car for the next 10 years buy the car if you're planning only for the next 6 months rent a car okay so the, the concept is going to be exactly the same if you rent it for 3 mm -hmm. years microsoft products you will feel that oh you could have just bought it you could have just bought okay. the product okay but if if you are not sure because you're starting with a project even your customers are not sure how long that is going to go it's an uncertain stuff because today uh, the businesses are growing with more of uncertainty and uh, to support that uncertainty today we need cloud because the cloud doesn't need to have a commitment i can just come use and go because today uh, why do you think the entrepreneurs have increased because now uh uh nook and corner of the road you have entrepreneurs developing some other other thing doing something on on the cloud because they know the fact that if it doesn't work they can just delete all their resources and get away from it it's a monthly charges so that gives the edge and that's a new line of business uncertainty <laughs> business becomes a new line of business okay uh yes. so that's that's how this cloud got uh, evolved because there is a lot of business in the uncertain uncertainty of the business okay yeah say for example even uh, there's a uh, in my previous organization uh, i was work i i i mean previous organization one of the customer is zynga uh, zynga you know it's a big gaming website uh, gaming guys they have their own data centers which has close to around 10000 physical servers and they run they hyper i mean they have installed a hypervisor on all the 10000 machines and each machine is running only one virtual machine even that they have still done it that way instead of installing it directly but even today they develop the new games on aws uh, they have half a million of contract with uh, aws where they have they, they have their own resources so because they don't know how much of uh, resources they need to develop a game to build a game and to uh, they don't know how much of traffic is going to come up because uh, to be very uh, frank on and to understand on your android app there are close to around 2 lakh games but how many games do you know only 10 or 15 which are whichever is the top 10 or 15 rest of the games doesn't get any traffic so means what mm. they somebody spend the time but end of the 6 months they don't have that game touched the customer so it's going to die so why should i invest on a hardware and keep it with me and zynga does that on a month yearly basis they create tons of more than 10 10 to 20 or 30 games or maybe 100 game uh, yearly easily hundreds of game they would just develop everything on aws cloud and whichever matures whichever stays they're going to buy 
the equivalent hardware on their premises and put it back, which makes sense. Mm. So even the big guys actually do this. Okay. So the, the cloud business is going to be there. I mean, just as an argument, if you really want to think, uh, cloud business is going to be there for the next coming years, whatever year it is. Uh, that's, a, that's a different line of business which everybody wants. In. I mean, everybody wants to use the resource of it. Okay. I think it's clear. Yeah, great. So let's catch up at uh, yeah. 30 IST tomorrow. So, yeah, so Andrew, it's 6 a.m. for you, your time. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, you. I will upload the recording in some time. Thanks for watching the video. For full course, please visit www.igmguru.com and enroll today.